ابتدایی یه فرصت خوب حالا پشت مدافع خدا داد عزیزی توی دروازه گل گل برای ایران خدا داد عزیزی پاس هم روی زمین یک به سردار آسمون به توی دروازه سردار آسمون گل به نام آسمون به برای ایران بزنه کریم ازداری فرد گل توی هرموزه کریم ازداری فرد در بازه پرتفال باز شد علی ازداری سامه تو توی هرموزه ازداری یه شبا حرکت از کوچان نجات پرسه بره کوچان نجات توی دروازه گل برای ایران دست آف آل لیت می Give my personal apologies for the. Uh, the cancellation of the press conference yesterday. We supposed to have the, the press conference and introduce the list, but unfortunately, I was forced to cancel the, the, the press conference, which I apologize a lot for. But I was forced to cancel the press conference, which I apologize a lot for. But I was forced Not only because they deserve it, but because uh, it is a good support for our training sessions in Qatar. I do believe that in this uh, present moment, these players are the players that they give us uh, a better balance in the team from the collective point of view. As both guru, of course, from the individual point of view, uh, probably uh, it was very difficult to. leave uh, a couple of players outside uh, of the list. It is always a very hard and difficult decision for the coach. Those players, they also deserve to be here. But uh, when we uh, need to make decisions to organize the team, we need uh, to create a good balance, a good balance in the team with deep solutions, prevent uh, injuries, Sometimes can happen. We hope that uh, we don't have more injuries after the uh, mid brain. The decisions have also not only to do with individual decisions, but uh, special with the, the collective uh, balance of the team. And part of our preparation was only possible uh, with the good cooperation of the clubs, good cooperations of the coaches, which we thank you on behalf of Team Melly. We thank you them very much for the support. They give to the national team. That's it. Now we departure today with the Iranian fans in our hearts, and uh, we'll try to do our best. Everyone, welcome back to another episode of Gol Bazan. We're really excited because the World Cup is kicking off super soon, like less than a week now, which is incredible. So I'm joined by Arya, Sina, and Sahan to talk about the upcoming squad that's been announced yesterday, and uh, the upcoming Tunisia game. And we're joined by journalists there as well to talk about it. So, yeah, well, guys, welcome back to another pod. Good to be back, Sina. Good to be back. Same, good to see you guys as well. Yeah. How, how excited are you guys? One to ten. Less than a week. Go on, Sand. You tell us. Uh, I think I think a ten, but I mean, I think less than a ten because I think the buildup compared to previous years hasn't been, I mean, for obvious reasons, both... Uh, From what's happening in Iran and from just the vibe of this World Cup in general, I think it's been de- a depressed vibe uh, compared to previous years. And the, just the fact that we haven't had, you know, usually we have like a month where everyone's with their national teams. The people are slowly arriving to the host country. Um, you're getting more interviews on the ground. There's like an atmosphere being built up. I don't think any of that existed this time. Um, so it's just we just had club games yesterday finish. And now in four days, like five days, it's going to start. So I think the excitement is less, but I think the profile of our games, the fact that our opponents are who they are, uh, and the fact that compared to previous years, we really have a chance, I think, to get out of the group, that gives real excitement, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think that the squad that's been announced, like I'm overall very happy. I'm I'm happy. I don't like jinx it but i'm happy that we haven't had to sustain any major major injuries like other teams in our group have um obviously touch wood we have one friendly coming up uh that we'll obviously talk about but yeah so let's let's move on to the uh team announcement that was yesterday obviously there was a press conference um that was scheduled at 1 30 uh, p.m iran time and that was cancelled 
and they mentioned it was like technical issues. There were obviously rumors behind the scenes. No, it's, it's always rumors around us. Uh, Sardar, Sardari and uh, one of our fitness coaches in Qatar since yesterday. So. Sardar به همراه یکی از مربیان بدن ساز ما از دیروز وارد قطر شدم. That showed that there's nothing to do with it. I like, will just gloss over this very very quick. But Sina, what did you kind of make of that? What were sort of like just so people are like aware what was going on there? Well, as you said, you know there was a press conference that was um, meant to be kind of the announcement of the of the squad, and there was a last minute cancellation, which they said was um, at Carlos Kerr's request. No, obviously the reports haven't haven't been confirmed, and, and there is no way of, of knowing for sure exactly exactly what happened. But um, there were kind of rumors and reports going around that there, there was late pressure on on Kerr's to to exclude Osmoon um, for his stance to the current events in Iran. And um, obviously, as, as we know, Kerosh, um, and as we've seen in the in the last eight, nine years, however long he's been he's been in Iran, um, that's not really something that he, he would accept. And um, we saw that the event it, kind of eventually the squad was announced, Osman was included. And I think we all took a um, took a, a, a sigh of uh, relief as well. Kerosh today had a uh, but of a kind of a Q&A with, with reporters and he said he kind of denied the rumours but I, I would have never expected Kerosh to come out and say oh yeah there was pressure on me to exclude or to drop Osmoon and, and I decided not to do it so he, he gave a very kind of diplomatic answer and, and what you would have expected from him anyway Yeah but I think the headline is that Osmoon has been included so that's, that's the main thing um so yeah i think maybe in a few years like he might he might open carlos Kroos might open up open, open up about it but yeah as for now headline osman's been included which is which is great news and better news as well is that his rehab has been going well and he hasn't had to miss the world cup because obviously he's been injured so that's also great news um okay cool let's move on to the squad so firstly uh let's talk about some notable absentees before we move on to the squad um aria what are some notable absentees for you well, I think, you know, for us, um, the, the squad, first of all, 25 players. So it's uh, that was a bit of a surprise. Obviously, 26 players is the maximum you can take to the World Cup uh, this time around. Took 25. Um, other really absentees, yes, you could say, you know, Zahedi potentially could have been there. Um, he has taken three strikers. You know, he's playing a 4-3-3 that there is one role to, to fill. And he's taken three players for that role. Well, then you can say the same with the goalkeepers. That there's four goalkeepers and there's only one role. So, um, you know, you can kind of put your your ideas there. Um, I mean, who's who's out there? He's playing for Charlevoix, who's starting quite regularly for them. He wasn't uh, called up either. He was under uh, Skocic, though. Um, I think he maybe would have added some some good quality, some good pace in the final third. Would he have started matches for Kirosh? Definitely not. I don't think so. But maybe he could have been a good option off the bench, considering there's there there's a, there's the missing of Syed Manesh, who brings that pace to this team, and we don't really have a lot of pace in that kind of attacking area of the pitch. I think maybe you could have provided that. Uh, other than that, really, I mean, obviously players like Gaia D, Mohebi, these are young players who have a chance to get in, but. Just they don't get in at this point. I think that guy he's not had the best of form. Mohe be a bit better, but I don't think he really is much better than the players that are currently called up. So ultimately, it is a fairly decent squad, but of course there is that kind of question of four goalies and and just twenty five players. So yeah, and obviously Omid Abrahimi, I don't know if you mentioned got got injured, so he that was probably his his place. I, I I'm assuming. The, the the 26th place. Sahan, what do you think? Like, why is he taking 25 players and not 26? And he's taking four goalkeepers. Isn't that a bit like, I don't know. Other national teams haven't done that. Yeah. I mean, first I would just say generally, the one thing for me that's key is that everybody who's on the list deserves to be at a World Cup. I don't think there's any player really that I would say from that list that I'd be like, oh, he is, there's no way he can be at a World Cup level. I think there was people like Nurak Khan and Sarlak that he cut I think that those were good cuts, in my opinion. Um, but with regards to the four goalies, he explained it as uh, it's like beneficial for the tr- type of trainings that they want to run. Um, I think he said that today uh, in the last training session before they left to Doha. 
So, I mean, you know, that's just his, uh, I guess, his, te his technical opinion on that. Um, I would also have filled the 26th place. Um, Arya mentioned Zohedi, who I think was a good shout. Um, but you have to keep in mind, he wasn't, he wasn't involved in any camp or list, even with Skocic. I think he just had maybe one appearance in a camp. So for Kairos to bring him into this kind of like sacred, you know, setting and group without having a chance to vet him, really, uh, I think that kind of makes sense. And Hussein Zadev for his form and the fact that he's playing, like, I mean, he's still has only started like three games this whole year. Is that really enough to get into a World Cup squad? Three games for Charleroi and like maybe a, two of them were okay. I think, you know, there's an argument to be made against that too. So, um, but yeah, the four goalies is a bit strange, but I guess, you know, for yeah. training purposes, if it makes sense for him, I mean, he's the coach. So, having spoken to the goalie coach, uh, Lopez, who, um, you know, he, he always wants to have a good atmosphere in his uh, coaching session. So I think, you know, having uh, Hosseini, Abadade, Bayron Van, and Niazman, all four of them, who are probably the four best goalies that we have, um, maybe it is better for them all to be together and they maybe do, uh, you know, play well together in training and it get, gets the best out of the, the starting goalie would probably be Bayron Van. But maybe it helps him develop his game, and it's just maybe the best way for them to go about it. Um. So yeah, and also if you look at it, I mean, from a coach's perspective, it's, it's an even number. You know, it's it's four rather than having three. I don't know. It, it's just that's just my ideas. I think that's probably what he's going with, and I think we need to respect that, of course, as as <laughs> as um the audience, and maybe he knows better than us. Maybe that's just the way he wants to do it. All right, so it seems very clear that Carlos Quirós has valued experience in this team, and so that that starts with the centre backs and the fullbacks across the defence. So the centre backs, I mean, I'm there's no real surprises here. Like, Sina, do you have any like thoughts about the centre backs? No real surprises. No, I mean you you've, you're you're absolutely right. Um, in terms of the centre backs, it was probably the only position that we knew who was going to get called up. Um, you have Majid Hosseini, Shojo, and uh, Purali Ganji, um, and of course Kan Oni, who have previously, again, most of them, three of them worked with Kairosh regularly, and Shojo has been such a key figure in qualification, and I think it was it, it was really difficult for, for Kairosh not to include him, and, and uh, he, he deserves to go as well. I mean, going back to what Sahan said, uh, Sahan said, majority of the players in there do deserve to go, and, and people like Khalilzad, they have contributed massively to, to, to us qualifying. In terms of fullbacks, I, I don't know how I feel about Reza Yon. Um, he, he's not going to start. I'll be disappointed if he does. Uh, but I think for a, for a backup, again, it's probably one of those situations where Kairosh hasn't had enough time to to work with, with people like Saleh Hardoni, for example, and has decided to go with, with what he knows. Um, you know, the people that he knows exactly what they're going to bring in. And, and you see that across the entire squad as well, even if you look in central midfield and, and further up. But one thing one thing I noticed, and I thought it might be worth um, discussing or, or at least pointing out, is that I was having a look at our squad in 2014 and 2018 and, and kind of looking at the transition between the World Cups, knowing this is our third World Cup in a row. 2014 to 2018, when you compare the squads, only six players survived from 14 to 18, and they were kind of the younger players like Jahan Bakhsh, um, uh, Hoj Safi, and, and so on. But then if you look at this squad compared to 2018, you see that massive jump. About 16 or 17 players have been included from, from, from that World Cup, from, from the World Cup in 2018. And the players who were cut are people like Huchan Najad, for example, who I think he's retired now. I've not heard of him in, in such a long time. And I think there is an element of the backbone of the team it's still the same from 2018 in terms of the generation, but there's also a couple of players where I think Kairush, like I said, has decided to go with what he knows. Reza Yon being one of them. Cheshmi for me is, is the other one. I would probably like to see Mehdi Pur in there um, um, unless he's got any injuries that, that I'm not aware of. Um, but I thought that was that was interesting and it probably gives us a better chance as well, knowing that the, the Kairush has, has worked with the majority of these players. And I was I would expect this bulk, the 16, 17 players would be the ones that play the bigger role in the three games compared to the rest. Yeah, I completely, I completely agree with you. Um, Ramin Rezaian is one that definitely splits decisions. Uh, I, I, we, we'll go into later in the episode whether like what your preferred like, starting 11 is against England in the first game. 
Um, but yeah, I definitely agree with you. So moving on to the wingers and the midfielders, any, any of you guys want to say anything about the defenders? Yeah, uh, just obviously a good one on, on Jalal. He, oh, he's been included in the squad. Um, he's the youngest player in the squad, actually, 24 years old. Uh, next after him is, is Saeed, actually, at 26. Uh, Jalal, I think, has got a good chance of playing in the World Cup. I think he's going to He's gonna he's gonna surprise some people. I think if he does well, it could be a similar situation to Maggi Tosini, who got the move to Trabzonspor uh, that summer in, after the Russia World Cup, and I think that he could be uh, an important player for us, uh, especially against the the US, who you know are a pacey side, and we need to have a, a left back in there who can maybe deal with that. Maybe Milad does that job, but I think Jaroli looked good against Uruguay and I think that from what I'm hearing anyway is that Kairos is quite impressed with him uh, so you never know he might be a starting player and a surprise for us I agree and I think that from the defenders the main point to note is that he's taken three left backs so clearly he also feels as many of us do that our left back position is not solid there is no standout candidate as of yet uh, I mean, Hodge Sefi has been around this team for like what feels like 50 years. And uh, he, we all know that he has some strengths and some weaknesses and those weaknesses aren't going to change over the course of this month. Uh, Milod, I think his decline was like pretty sharp, really, from the level he was at a couple of years ago when he first went to Ghent um, to where he is now. I know his form got a little bit better this season, but for the national team, I mean, his last games were really poor, I think. And then you have Jalali, who looked very, you know, uh, comparatively quite solid against Uruguay. Um, but he's, you know, a young player. And I think that, like Arya said, Kairush, to include a young player in a list where he's stuck with most of the, the backbone of the team um, and the experienced guys, even for like fringe positions, um, that shows that he's, you know, done well in training. Uh, he's done well in the PEC uh, sessions in the past couple months and I think especially in those friendlies he showed that he can be a, a serious alternative yeah I agree with you and like, I think Ari and I watched the Uruguay game yeah Stood sorry out. go on Cena go on Cena sorry about that no no go on no I was just going to say and on on the two right backs Moharami and Ramir Zayan I think you know on paper those are probably our two best right backs but I, I actually do believe that Daniel Esmaili Far is a very good player and could have made this squad, but I feel like uh, K. Roche was never going to pick him. I think that's that kind of it boils down to that as well. It's it's, it's who K. Roche really trusts and believes in. I think because Roman Rezaion is a guy who he knows, I think he was always going to bring him back into the fold because obviously Scotch took him out of the national team for a couple of years. He was always going to bring him back, and I think that there was if he showed any kind of good performance or whatever it may be he was going to put him in the national team squad for the world cup so he's in so i think that you also probably... have to consider that sorry to cut you off but hardoni was called up yeah he's been in the pe- his sessions he's been in the recovery sessions he's been there and even rezoyan wasn't there in the last camp because his passport uh had a problem so it was literally just hardoni and Moharami. so hardoni had a chance and i think that um in my opinion, if Kairos had an extra six months to work with these guys, he would probably be taking Aradoni right now. Uh, but he just didn't have that opportunity. And from what he saw, that player and a few others, that the younger guys who weren't included, hadn't showed enough to say like, okay, if I ask you to do this specific tactical instruction, uh, you are definitely going to improve on the weaknesses and do what I say, basically. He just hasn't had that track record with these guys. So he's gone with, you know, a couple of those players that he knows, yeah, they have weaknesses. We all know that. But if I tell them to do X, Y, and Z, I know they're going to be able to do it to like this percent. Um, and I, I think, I think for the, you... sorry, Sina, just the last, last point for me. I think for the Asian Cup, those players like Hardani, like, for example, Hosting, they will come back in. But the, because there's only three months to go since he's got the job, there is no way he's going to bring in new players, in my opinion. I think when you compare it to um, to the left back situation, Moharami has that right back spot leaned on <clears throat> in terms of him starting, and, and there is no need for Kairos to take a risk. Um, like I said, I would have liked to see Hardani, but um, I think that also contributes to him 
um, taking Rezo on in comparison to left back, like as you guys said, we've had various problems. I think Nur Afghan was probably the standout left back during qualification as well. Um, but yeah, um, Jalali again to reflect everything you guys said, and looking at the last World Cup where we rotated that position in the three games, I would expect him to get to get some minutes as well. I think Haidt played all three games from the start, right? I but think, think Mohammed he started one game. I think did he? I might be wrong. I don't think he did. But at least he was a substitute. Oh, but he came on three. quite early yeah. in, in one of those games. I think it was against Portugal. Uh, 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 he came exactly on. He started all three. Yeah. Yeah, but Milad yeah. came on like quite early. I think it was against Portugal and they got the, the throw in against Spain. So he did play all three. I think he, I think he played all three games, Milad actually. And he played a good amount of minutes too. Because I remember it, you know, Hodge Sefi actually been taken off early versus Spain and we had an injury and then versus Portugal he was getting torn up by Quaresma. And Milad did a much better job when he came on. All right, let's move on to the midfielders and the wingers. And again, like experience all over the board um there there aren't any like lack of experience in this position uh like very notable like norala he makes the squad even though he sustained a light injury so he's in the squad um what other sort of like notable like yeah i think these are just we're very yeah oh well, yeah bruce well, Cheshmi is, is very like unique as well that's not the one yeah i think um ali Kanimi coming back in is a is a big one because mm, that's you true. Know, he's, he's not being part of the qualification at all um, he missed pretty much all of last season. He's obviously played a bit this season now, uh, for Kayseri Sport in Turkey. He's he's done okay. He actually played at centre back for one of the re- recent games and did a really bad mistake in that game. But the coach said that I shouldn't have played him there. But I think he's good to come back. I think he's actually one of Kirosh's favourites. And actually, Kirosh has never had Ali Karimi at, at, at a continental or international competition because he's always been injured. He got injured for the World Cup in 2018. He got injured for the Asian Cup in 2019. So he's finally made it to a World Cup now. So you know, good on him to be able to get there. Um, and he could be a a wild card starter as well. Um, and Ruzbe Cheshmi seems to have come in as a defensive midfielder as a side replacement because obviously only the Brahmi got injured. So um, that's and I think Sina said there. I think Mehdi Pro would have been a good shout for that role. Yeah, I fully agree. I think that um, Ali Karimi, I've watched him in most of his games this year for Kayseri Sport. And, you know, he's a, he's a good player. I think that his technical quality uh, from a deep position is much better than the average level of our midfielders. He can actually get the ball, receive under pressure, turn, make a smart decision, make a forward pass. He's a physical presence. I mean, he's a big guy. Um, I, I think that there are always have been concerns about his mobility and speed, even from the days that he was a youth player. Um, you know, I've heard his coaches, old coaches, they've talked about that, you know, he never had that kind of kind of speed. But I think that, yeah, he could really be a solution for us in some of these games, especially in the games where, you know, we're going to be m- more on the front foot and we're going to need to really get, service from deep to our front players uh i think that he could be a real option and yeah i mean ruzbe i would also have preferred mehdi poor but again i think mehdi poor is quite a similar profile to ali Kadi. uh i think that they do a lot of the similar things and um cheshmi is a for his lack of speed and maybe lack of technicality he is quite a smart player in terms of his positioning he's obviously quite a physical presence he can play multiple roles so I think, you know, that was always, he's always been a little bit one of Kairos' favorites, but I'm, I'm happy to see Ali Kairi being included. I think we need to mention Salak because we've all, we were all frustrated with him during qualification and he's not been invited, rightly so. And what I think is, it, I still think it's a bold move from Kairos and I think it's a, it's a big, big indication and sign as to how much Kerush doesn't rate him. Because we've had problems in central midfield, certainly in terms of numbers as well as quality. And to not take the guy who, for me wrongly, has been involved in qualification and has been in and around the squad, I think that's that's a big decision, especially to bring in Cheshmi, who, again, there's another argument to be made there, but to bring in Cheshmi, who hasn't been involved in Timeli since, since um, Kerush left. Um, and I can't see Salak being involved again. And, and I think there's... When something like this happens, I always I always think there's got to be questions asked as to how a player of this quality 
has been allowed not just to be involved in the odd, odd squad here and there, but to be the first substitute or to be a starter ahead of players who, putting aside the experience, certainly in terms of intelligence, technical ability, every everything that you guys you guys just mentioned, there are players that are head and shoulders above him. You mentioned Ali Karimi. Ali Karimi and Salak came through the youth squad in Sepahan together. They, they broke through the team on the cruncher together. Karimi has always been head and shoulders above Salak. As Sahan said, he's, Karimi has always had the issue regarding his mobility. He's not agile. There is the issue of you're not fast, but there's also an issue of, of, of being agile enough to be able to cover areas, not cover a lot of ground, but be able to cover areas. And I think that's where his injuries haven't helped him. In terms of technical ability, I think after Zatullahi, as you guys said, to be the link between attack and defense, Ali Karimi is a great option. With Mehdipur, the reason I brought him up is because we have we have players who, again, like we said, Ali Karimi and Ezatolohi, who are good at playing, let's say, the number six role, who can be that link, who can be that presence. And we also have the creative side in, for example, um, Somon Godus. What we want, or why I wanted to see, was a player who can cover a bit more ground, which Ebrahimi did in the World Cup. Now, Sahan mentioned that he he's not he doesn't have that mobility, and I and and I agree to a certain extent. I think yes, from a, from an ideal perspective, you want someone who who does have a lot more um, kind of in him uh, to be able to play a more box to box role. But from the options that we had, and and to have him as a as a replacement for Nurullahi, or you know if Nurullahi gets injured, who I think he will start. Mehdipur would have been a much better option because I feel like now Chesh, the only position he can play is the six. And for me, he's the third option behind Ezatulai and uh, and Ali Karimi. So unless he's got another surprise in store for us. Well, for, Vahid Amiri is Chesh, Yeah, well. I was literally about to say, would you and put Vahid Amiri in that role? I, because he, he has he has stamina. He's got the legs to do that. Absolutely, he does. But there is also the fitness issue with, with Amiri, who's had a, a longer injury. And let's be honest, Amiri, what I've seen, so Amiri came onto the scene quite late in terms of his age. We saw him in 2015 Asian Cup. He's always had legs. He's had pace. And the technical ability has been there. What he's developed is his intelligence. What he's lost is a little bit of that mobility. He still does have that, but not, not as much as he used to. Amiri is a good option. But again, I would have liked to see a natural central midfielder who's used to playing that role. Because Amiri now is more of a... This, this is going to sound bad, but he's more of like an attacking Hot Safi, where he can play three or four positions. And arguably, that's one of the reasons why he's going there, because um, he, he does have the experience. Like I said, he does, he's a little bit more intelligent and he would potentially be in line to, to play in this starting 11 in the front three if, if Osmond doesn't start. But like I said, I, I, I personally would have liked to see Mehdi Four solely because for a kind of a direct replacement for Nurullahi, a central midfielder, he would have probably been the best option. I think also you, you need to, to put in there, I think Hoy Safi will also be an option in midfield for Kairosh because he played him in, in that role against Uruguay. So I think he still has a an eye for that. He played him there in the Asian Cup as well. So I think Unfortunately, Hoy Safi will start. Yeah, you just don't I, know where. I don't know where he's going to play him, you know. So maybe he plays him at left back. I mean, obviously... He played at left back against Senegal. He played in midfield against Uruguay. Then he went to left back when Jalali came off. So I think um, there's a there's an, a, a thing to be made there. I, I think ultimately his, it's going to be a four three three. And I think whether let's just say Ali Kanimi and and Saeed as a total, play together, the system Kairosh plays will always ensure these players are protected. I think that that's the kind of key here. I mean, yes, we speak about. Ali Kanemi hasn't got any mobility, all these kind of things. The system, if he's going to play him, he'll he'll make sure that he plays him in a role or a a, a team role that protects that, that weakness in his game. Because I don't think he'll want to make uh, Ali Kanemi chase um, Phil Foden for 90 minutes. You know what I mean? Or uh, And that's in stark contrast to what we saw with Skocic, where a lot of his tactical setups actually yeah. uh, highlighted the weakness weaknesses of our players more than anything. So you had somebody like Nuru Lahi, who has a very limited technical ability when he's receiving the ball under pressure with his back to goal. You had him suddenly almost being the main uh, ball carrier and distributor for the team, which made no sense. 
you know, the game should be being built out of guys like Ezzatul Lahi or Qudus, uh, or to even some extent Muhayr Rami. But then suddenly you had Nurul Lahi receiving like 90% of the balls from our defense and losing like half of those. So I think, as you said, Arya, the key thing is to look back at what K. Rush has done. K. Rush has always minimized the weaknesses of our players and shown their strengths. So whatever system he chooses, whatever personnel he chooses, I don't think their weaknesses are going to be as evident as we've seen in some of the friendlies and qualification matches. And I think you look at like a game that Salak played against uh, Syria. He came off injured in that game. He played alongside Saeed in a 4-2-3-1. And you could right away see he wasn't comfortable bringing the ball out of defence. And, you know, a, a, a guy like Ali Karimi, or Mehdi for, for, for instance, who maybe have that quality on the ball, doesn't matter if they're not the quickest. If you can still do that, you have players around you who can be here, who can still offer a little bit of support in that in those areas where you need a bit of pace. So for me, ultimately, th- this team is... Look, we're not the best team in the world, right? We don't have amazing midfielders. So we have to use what we have available at our, to, to our benefit. So if Ali Kanimi is going to start, let's say, alongside Saeed, it might be beneficial in some... And it might be that we do lose the ball and maybe Ali Kanimi does um, out, get outpaced by Phil Foden or Mason Mount, for example. It might happen. But that's, that, that's the risk we have to take because ultimately we're a team that unfortunately doesn't have... And I have I mean, who's 28 years old or uh, Omid Ibrahimi who's 20 years old. We don't have those players anymore, so we maybe have to 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 change it up a wee bit. So I think Kairos will be flexible with that, um, but we'll see what happens. I, I hope I just hope there's no injuries because this is a this is a role the midfield for Iran. The reason why this is going for so long this discussion is because that midfield is a very important role for Iran. If that if there's any injuries there, we're gonna be in a bit of bother, in my opinion. Yeah, I think the way that we play and the way that Carlos Queiroz likes to play, if 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 every person in that midfield doesn't do their role correctly, that's when you get a situation where Osman gets incredibly isolated, and there are no way we have to keep inviting pressure. Yeah. Should speak about not... um, sorry, just cut also... you off there. Should, should also speak about the wingers and attacking midfielders. Completely forgot about that, but yeah, we'll go on to that in a second. I mean, I think also <laughs> just on the last point, and this kind of builds into the wingers and attacking mids. A profile like Toremi and what he's been able to do for Porto this year as not only a forward, but really like a tra- uh, tr- translational player that's been involved in so much of the build-up, uh, so much of the sort of... Um... That's a di- dimension that he's brought into his game recently, right. yeah. So I honestly think that Kairos is going to be banking on that for 90 minutes every single game more than maybe what we expect right now. I think Toremi's role is not going to be just hanging out up top, which it kind of was under Skocic. I mean, he, him and Osman were just like, all right, you guys are up there. We'll get you the ball somehow, sometimes, and then just do something. But I think Tarim is going to have a role in the build-up play. He's going to be asked to connect with the midfielders, maybe even lower. I mean, he might even drop even lower at times, uh, which he was doing during the Uruguay game when he came on. And I think that could give you, uh, you know, a dimension that we don't um, have with our current midfielders. And his work off the ball you know people talk about the mobility that our midfielders maybe lack but if our wingers are effectively acting as additional midfield players and are able to cover vast distances from the side into the interior eight position then that could also cover um that and i think tarami definitely has that in his game i mean he has an insane gas tank um and i think even somebody like john bach uh, or torabi who showed against Uruguay uh, that he can really help on the defensive end those guys can help um, this sort of midfield conundrum that we have as well you're right and I think when you look at the opponents as well and the way they play with the back three and and especially the the wing backs attacking I think that's when the um, the wingers and, and the work that they do really comes in because you don't want to just rely on on our full backs to deal with the the wide players and like you said Tolemy has always offered that and we've seen Jahan Bach through it and, and even if you look at the previous tournaments on the on the Kairosh and going back to 2014 Khosrow Heydari was starting on on the right who yeah technically maybe he's not amazing but he was he was covering a lot of a lot of ground for a for a for an aging midfield that didn't have the legs that it once did I also want to um, add a quick point to that as well because we, again we speak about these kind of fantasy players like Ali Karimi again who maybe gained off pace somebody who did that who is that kind of player and did show that 
work rate was Masu Chojoy against Argentina on the right wing, you know? So, again, I think having a guy like Carlos Queiroz, he might bring out qualities in players that maybe we don't see regularly. So, we'll see what happens. I think I think it's going to be an interesting one. But um, I'm excited to see how someone uh, gets on, someone will do this, because I think he, I think, in my opinion, he played unbelievably against Uruguay. And when he came on um, against Senegal, when he came on for Sarlacc, who had a horrible game, uh, seen I mean you were not happy with that game whatsoever when Salak was on but when someone came on he changed the game I think someone's role in that kind of number eight role is going to be if he plays well I think we we attack with a lot of uh, intent and we can create chances if he doesn't play well I think things can be difficult for us and we have to rely on other players like Taremi more and I really want to see a someone who has that deja ga effect, which is not an easy comparison to make because he's not that kind of player. I'm not saying you should be like him, but have an effect on the team where he's going to be creative. But unfortunately, I think that someone doesn't have those kind of characteristics all the time. He he is a good player. He is technically good, but also he is also quite hardworking. So I think, again, in Kairos' team, there are going to be qualities that he brings out from someone that maybe we don't we don't normally see. I mean, just on someone, I think that he is. If you look at this whole squad, he is maybe the player that you say if he plays well, he changes the equation for us. Because right now we're expecting that if we are going to be successful in this tournament, Torrem is going to have to be huge. He's going to have to be huge for us. Osmond's going to have to be to some extent that his fitness allows. He's going to have to be effective. Uh, the defenders are going to have to be solid and minimize their mistakes. So we have those things are a given. But suddenly, if we, you get something from Odus that is something along the level that he showed against Uruguay or more, I think that takes our midfield up a couple levels. Um, and for him, it's always been the same. You know, Dejoga, I felt with Timeli, he took the games by the scruff of the neck a lot of the times. You know, he would, with his technical ability, with his confidence, with his physicality, he would really have an effect on the game. And I feel like someone's technical ability to do that is there. I think at Brentford, he's developed, even in limited minutes, he's developed the uh, fitness level to be effective player off the ball. But I think it's a question of combining all those things into multiple performances and um, really being assertive. You know, he has the technical quality to be assertive, to get the ball from the defenders and start our game. And uh, and be effective in the box too, uh, and if he does that, I think it could really change the equation for us. See, now I've got a question for you about Jahan Bash, right? Obviously, he's not playing as regularly as he wants to be playing in Feyenoord, um, but he is going to be a starter in this national team. There's no doubt about it, and he's not really got a lot of competition. And of course, there's Kolis Ade. I don't see Kolis Ade really being a starter for the national at the World Cup. What does he have to do to make us feel like, you know, he is that guy? You know, what does he have to do? What do you mean by he's that guy? Is it to be a match winner? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we've seen, look, putting aside his club career, if you if you look at him um, in the national team setup, when has been the only period in which he turned out to be a match winner? It was on the Skocic, where he was getting to getting into kind of more advanced positions, getting into more dangerous areas, getting into the box a lot more often than he used to. Now, he's not going to have that role on the Kairos. We've seen it before, and we know now, certainly in terms of a tournament, he's not going to do that. But what he does have, he's got the experience now. I think he's he he's off the ball game from a from a defensive perspective. On the right, I would trust him far more than Kolizade or, or any other option that we've ha- we have who can play on that side. And um, I, I don't think we should rely on him to be the match winner in, in this um, in this tournament. Sahan mentioned Taremi. Taremi has been the focal point for Iran prior to his move to Portugal. Look at the 2015 Asian Cup. Look at the qualifiers for the um, sorry 2019 Asian Cup. Look at the uh, qualification for for 2018 and and again for 2022. And and now we're still relying on him, his intelligence, not to, to score goals but to create goals, 
for for Osman and, and his teammates. Jahan Bakhsh's role is completely different, and 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 it will be for me on on the K rush. Um, he'll be kind of reverting back to what he was, and I know it's probably frustrating for us to watch, knowing what he's achieved in club level. But that's that's the role. I don't. The thing I agree with you. I don't. But the thing is, I don't want him to be the match winner. I don't think he needs to be that. What I want from him is just to bring, first of all, a calmness on the ball, that he has a higher technical level than a lot of our players have, and also a fighting spirit. Because I think his best moments have come when he showed that kind of tenacity, that even when he makes a mistake, he's the first person to press. Even when he makes a mistake, he's the first person to demand the ball again. And sometimes I feel he gets caught up in trying to almost be too cute or too technical. And he does things that remind me of what Shoja used to do in his last five years, where suddenly he's doing these back heels and giving dangerous square balls that he assisted the goal for Algeria. I mean, things like that. I, I just hope that he eliminates that. I mean, if he just gives a display where he covers the ground defensively, where he fights, where he's tackling, where he has a high energy, and then he just retains the ball, like at least 70, 80% of the time, he will have done a great job, in my opinion. You're absolutely right. And I think if you actually look at why that happens, I think when you look at a player, again, you use a great example in Shoja'i, you take a player who's extremely attacking, who always wants to drive forward, who always wants to be in those positions, and you almost cage them, it gets frustrating. So then his touches are limited. The amount of times he gets on the ball is limited. And then he, as the game goes on, he feels like he needs to do something special to be seen, to almost like satisfy himself with his game but when we look at how he's evolved how he's evolved i think those moments that you're referring to has reduced certainly in the last four years i would say i think he's a lot more kind of uh, his, his understanding of 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 how he needs to perform for the team has has improved he does more simple things he doesn't always take the risky option he plays for the team and and, and i think that will certainly help, help um Kairush as well i mean really what we're looking for I think to summarize from him is just an old school right winger performance. You know, someone who's going to give the width, someone who's going to help a lot his fullback and his midfielders, someone who has technical quality to keep possession. And then when he is around the box, just to be assertive. I mean, if you have a chance, you put your foot through it. You know, it's okay. You know, if you miss, sometimes we see on club level that a few mistakes from him in the offensive third, and he's beating himself up. He doesn't take the next five times he gets the ball and has a chance to cut in and shoot, he won't do it. So I think for him, more than anything at this point, it's the mental. If he can get himself in the right mental state for three games, you know, to maybe prove some people wrong about him, then he'll be effective. He doesn't need a score, but yeah, he can be very effective. Yeah, I completely agree with everything you guys have said. Um, so let's move on to the strikers. Um, there's only kind of, I mean, outside the the attacking midfielders and like wingers, I guess, we've got Osman, Tarami, and Ansari Fard. Um, out of them, our only kind of like out and out number nine is Osman. Are you guys surprised that we maybe don't have a substitute in that position? I know Tarami can play in that position. It's not really the preferred sort of. You want him to build up play, as we mentioned before. Um, but yeah, what do you guys think? Yeah, for for me, as I said at the start, I think Shahab Zahidi would have been a nice option to have off the bench because of that reason. Um, but, you know, I think Ansari Farad, you know, he scored against Man United in the in the Europa League, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, you know, he's still a good player and he, he also got a great assist for Tarami against Uruguay. He's still a good player. He's still not, he's only 32 years old. He's not that old. And he's obviously very experienced. There's no way that Ansari Farad is going to get dropped. So that's out of the discussion completely. Um, so I think, yes, I, I, I actually do think there would have been a there is another striker missing there in that list. But, you know, and obviously Osmond is injured. Yeah, well, he was injured. Now he's back from injury and he's he is going to play. Um, I don't know if in the start or not, but, you know, hopefully he does. But, you know, yeah, again, if he gets injured, re-injures, if he, re if he aggravates it, you, you, know, there's, you need one more striker. So, yeah, I think it would have been good to numerically to have another one. I mean, for me, it also just, to some extent, it highlights that he's pretty confident in Osborne's fitness for what he wants to do on the pitch. Um, so and he's basically saying that I trust basically even a half fit Osborne more than I would say, you know, an extra forward or, or whatever. 
which I mean, to some extent, I agree with too. I think the things that count against somebody like Zohedi is just a lack of experience at this level. I mean, he's coming sometimes off the bench still in Hungary and he's been effective. I mean, he's scored some excellent goals, but this level is so much higher. And for him to not have any practice at all with the team and just come in and throw him on for the last 15 minutes and expect that would have a different outcome than just sticking with, you know, the Taremi, uh, Osmoon, uh, and Sardi Fard, kind of whatever's, you know, whoever's on the pitch between those three. I think that I kind of see where he's coming from. I would say the one person that clearly would be here, and in my opinion, the ideal list for Kairos would have been Alohior as the 26th man and Ebrahimi replacing Cheshmi. I think that's probably what he would have done if everybody was, you know, healthy and fit. Uh, because yeah. Alohior has shown that he could affect this level of game. Whereas guys like Hossein Zodeh, Zohedi, and others necessarily have, you know, haven't shown that. So yeah, and just on uh, Allah, your people keep saying on social media that he's going to get called up. Well, the, the list is is finalized. Monday was the final day of announcing a list, so he can't be added to a twenty six player, whatever you want to call it. So anyone who's trying to say that he's going to get called up, he's not. He's just not. He's injured. He's he's still injured. He's going to come back after the World Cup. Okay, so just stop it. <laughs> I think. I Move mean, on. are you going back to the question you asked in terms of? Who, um, oh, well, for me also, who can replace Jahan Bash on that right hand side? It would have been Alohior because he has the legs, he's got the uh, attacking uh, outputs, but also his his uh, work off the ball uh, defensively is is really really good as as we've seen in Hull City. So that would have been the ideal replacement if we wanted to replace Jahan Bash. But in terms of the strikers, I know you guys keep talking about Shahab Zahedi. I don't understand the hype. I don't understand why he would be invited. If I had the option, and, and literally echoing what, what Sahan said, if I had the op- if I look to my bench, I need to replace Osman, and I've got Ansari Fad and Zahedi. It's not even a competition. I'm going for a player that's been in and around the national team for so long. He's one of the main players in the squad as, as um, a character, but also in terms of his ability. And he's got the experience. He's got the intelligence. He's And, and I think he will play. Um, more than people people expect in, in this World Cup, certainly because of um, Osmond's fitness as well. And, and for the 26th player, I always think if you have an additional space in the team, always take a young player who's probably not going to play, but you know he's going to become a key figure going forward. And Zahedi is certainly not that. Zahedi is not a player that will feature for the national team, even in the Asian Cup. Um, so if ever there was to be a 26th player, whilst Allah Yor is injured, as as you mentioned, Hossein Zadeh might have been might have been an option to be considered, but not because he's earned the right to, to be there, but because we know he's got the potential to become a figure that will feature a lot more often. And I think on the point of the young players, you know, I've always been an advocate for you know having as many in the squad involved as possible. I would even have liked to see somebody like Kolo Bandelu potentially. Uh, included as a midfielder who's you know very mobile uh, has a lot of energy and work rate but you know ultimately I don't think we have any young players at the moment in this particular moment like this month it's two months that he's been working with them that say you know what it doesn't matter that I'm less experienced uh, or you know whatever I'm better than these other options I don't think any of the young players have shown that uh, and I, I don't think any of them are at that level that you can say, yeah, this player is definitely better than X, Y, and Z. And it doesn't matter that he hasn't played with the national team. You know, somebody like Majid Hosseini, who came out of nowhere at the last minute, he convinced K. Rush of that. You know, he said that, you know what, I am. I am I'm a, at a higher level right now than somebody like Jalo. I, I can do that. And I think that the young players, you know, they still haven't reached that point. Somebody like Hosseini Zodid, if he had 10 games right now for Charleroi, Maybe that could have pushed the envelope a bit. If somebody like Mohebi had stayed in Europe and was, uh, you know, producing in Portugal, maybe that would have forced the issue. But I don't think any of them have done quite enough to say based on merit that they definitely deserve to be there. You know, they could be there. But if you want to say, you know, forcing K. Roche's mind, I wouldn't say any of them have done, you know, uh, enough. All right, before we move on to the Tunisia game, uh, the friendly that's coming up, just quickly want to mention that on the previous podcast, we talked about this, um, but Arajanian has now officially become the Iranian assistant coach. I know Nekonom was up for contention. 
he turned down the job and yeah, this was official news. So I wanted to, to tell you guys. All right. So there were some fan questions before we move on to the Tunisia game. However, um, we've pretty much answered all of them. So um, yeah, get them in for the next pod that we're going to be doing. But thanks for the questions. All right. So the Iran-Tunisia game is in Doha, November 16th, 2 p.m. local time. And the game will be behind closed doors, I think, at a, like a training stadium as well in Doha. Won't be broadcast on TV, so none of us can watch it. Um, and that was requested by both teams. Before we go on to the general thoughts, we did an interview with Tunisia sports journalist Sohail Khamira. Okay, I'm joined by uh, Sohail Khamira, uh, Tunisian football journalist. Um, good to have you on on Global Down Podcast. How are you, my friend? Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh uh, just speak to us about your own your own work for Tunisian uh, sport, for Tunisian football. Uh, what kind of stuff do you do? All right. Uh, thank you for having me once again. So I'm a Tunisian uh, freelance journalist. I write mainly for BBC Africa, Cuff Online, Middle East Eye, and various English-speaking media outlets. I mainly cover Tunisian sports and other topics, but my main focus is on sports. Fantastic. Uh, good to have you on. Uh, obviously, we're covering this uh, this uh, national team because you're playing against Iran uh, on November 16th in Doha. Of course, Tunisia is also going to the World Cup. They're going to be in Group D with uh, France, Australia, and Denmark. Uh, this is your uh, is it your second World Cup in a row, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe your third World Cup in a row. Um, you were definitely in the last World Cup. I don't know if you were in the one before that. Uh, 20, no, 2014. So this is your second World Cup in a row. So you're an experienced team for sure. Um, w- what is the uh, the the mindset for uh, Tunisia going to the World Cup in the uh, in, in Qatar and, and in, in Group D? Hello. I think I've lost you, Suhail. Ah, oh, I'm back. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Did you get a question? I just I asked you the question there. Did you get it? No, no I did not. I didn't okay. hear. It. Uh, last thing I heard was the World Cup. I just I just asked you like about uh, um, the the thoughts about going to the World Cup in in, in Qatar and Group D uh, for for Tunisia. It's uh, it's very exciting. The World Cup is uh, is always a very exciting occasion for Tunisians. This is our sixth World Cup. We've been in 1978, 1998. 2002, 2006, and then we missed 2010, 2014. Uh, the then we missed 2010, and then 14, and then we were back in 18. Now it's always fun. It's always fun to to be back in the World Cup. It's just sort of it's a wonderful occasion for Tunisians. People, Tunisians love football. They love the national team. It's just one of those things that that. People just sort of forget about it every once in a while, but then all of a sudden, all you see is like, oh, wow, we're playing a game against Mali or something. Oh, wow, <laughs> something's going to happen. And then you have like all these people joining for the national team. It's a it's a very festive occasion for Tunisians. A lot, a lot of Tunisians have traveled to Russia in 2018, and a lot of Tunisians are expected to be in Qatar uh, this time because not many will be traveling from Tunisia, I guess. Mm. Uh, but since a lot of Tunisians are based in Qatar, I don't have the exact number, but it's a lot. Like in tens of thousands of Tunisians mm. are based in Qatar and working there. So they will be the the main men and women on the field there in Tunisia, representing Tunisians. So. And and what about the group itself? And obviously, you got France, Australia, Denmark. It's not a difficult group. It's quite a good group, I think. Obviously, France are are, are a tough team, but Australia and Denmark, you no, know, that could be a game. Those that could that could be good for for Tunisia. It could be. It could be. I mean, we're we're a bit optimistic uh, about our chances. I mean, it's not a it's not an as we call it like an an Arabic like an iron group, but yeah. still, it's a. I personally think it's a bit of a tough group. It's not easy. It's not a group to be taken slightly. I mean, we've mm-hmm. seen Australia's journey to make it here. Quite exciting games and uh, the wonderful goalie. <laughs> yeah. Great uh, show. So that was something yeah. to behold. Uh, the, I mean, France, sure, the defending champions. But still, I mean, 
even Denmark, I'm a bit like cautious. A lot of people are talking about like France and France of France, but like personally speaking, I'm like, I'm more concerned about Denmark to be honest. Mm. I mean, yeah, like, I mean they, they did would, play they did pretty well in the Euros, right? So yeah, like, yeah, it could be a difficult team. I know. I mean, I, I would never in a million years call Denmark an underdog or something, yeah. but it's just like one of those teams that you just sort of forget about it until you're faced with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're like, oh, wow, I didn't expect you to be, to, to be this long. Um, we're very optimistic. As I said, like, we don't, the thing about Tunisians is that we don't expect much. So the disappointment doesn't hit us that hard. You know what I mean? Yeah. We will be more, we were super thrilled in 2018 with a victory over Panama. That would made us super excited and we're still talking about it to this day. I mean, we won a game in the World Cup, so that is already in itself, within itself, is quite an achievement for Tunisia. And we're just going in for the, for the fun, for the joy. If we, we are hoping, of course, don't get me wrong, we're not playing to lose or something like that. We will, we will play to win, but at the same time, we whatever we do, we are so very happy about it. That I find that very wonderful about Tunisia and about Tunisians. It's the participation in the World Cup that really matters most for Tunisians. Yeah. As long as we're here, we're fine with whatever you do. We are so we're behind you one hundred percent. We are very proud of you. We're very proud of this achievement. We're not expect. We're not putting he- heavy expectations on you guys. We're just here to have a good time, play wonderful football. To represent Tunisia, it's always nice to see Tunisia represented on on a global scale. Yeah. Tunisians take great pride in this. They all they consider Tunisia to be a like a small country, a small nation, small in in size, small in population. We're only like what, like roughly twelve million people. So it's always nice to see Tunisia like being the talk of the nation. So in yeah. a way, this is an event. Obviously, um, as I said, you, we're, we're playing against Iran now uh, for the, the last preparation game going to Qatar. Um, what is the squad looking like? Is there any injuries in this team? Is there anyone that's going to be new? Obviously, guys like Wabi Khazri, for example, are a little bit more familiar with uh, people who watch European football. Um, what is the squad details just now? Um. So far in the Tunisian squad, there are no surprises. It's going to be mostly the familiar faces. I said Khazri, Msekni, Mesbri, uh, all the faces, uh, Dragar, Saiduni, yeah. uh, yes, Siri. It's going to be pretty much all the familiar faces. We're not going to see uh, a lot of uh, fresh blood, if I might say. Uh, it's going to be pretty much the usual squad, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? No, nothing out of the ordinary. I think it's going to be very, very, very similar to the squad that we saw against uh, Comoros or against Brazil for the last few games. Yeah. With maybe like a few differences in players, but we're not expecting huge changes on the Tunisian squad. There was like a, a debate, ongoing debate for the few last few days in Tunisia about goalkeeper yeah. post. Right. That has been stirring up some pots here and there. And it's always been... It's always a bit of a topic of conversation here in Tunisia. There's a huge rivalry in Tunisian football, okay? Every team, their fans included, mainly their fans, they want to be in the national team. They want yeah. their players on the national team. You know how it is. Of course, it raises the team's value and it gives them bragging rights. You know what I mean? Sure. My goalkeeper is the main goalkeeper for the national team. My goalkeeper plays for the national team. My defender is there. You know what I mean? So this yeah. has stirred up some pots with especially with the goalkeeper position here and there, created some tension between some teams. But yeah. other than that, in a way like it shifted the attention away. Like there were all this been talks about goalkeepers, goalkeepers, who's gonna be number one, who's gonna be number one. But we do realize it's gonna be Ayman Dahman from CS Faxian. Is going to be Tunisia's number one goalkeeper. Yeah, perfect for the, for the World Cup. So, but other than that, it's just same usual face. Nothing yeah. out of the order. Similar, the, like up top of my head, name like the lineups for yeah. a few games. So similar faces then to when we played you guys in in twenty eighteen. We lost that game one zero, and Milad Mohammadi scored the own goal in that game, which um. Uh, I remember quite well actually. He scored his own goal and uh, we lost the game one zero. Uh, so it should be quite similar to them, right? Uh, not much, not much different to the twenty eighteen. Maybe with a few players, um, maybe we'll not see for Jenny Sessi. We might not have Fakhreddin Benyusef. 
right. some player, maybe like a few players missing when you might not have Sessi, Ben Yusuf, uh, who's back then? Yekin, was he there? A few players, uh, Dylan Brown will not be there. Right. Maybe like a few players missing, like some key players mm. missing. But other than that, just same old squad. It's not going to be the same squad from 2018. A lot of familiar faces. Yeah. But... But still, uh, from the recent games, more recent games like 2021 and 2022, it's going to be very, very similar squad, same tactics, same squads. Um, recent developments in Tunisian football, uh, there are some controversial things going on. Uh, what can you speak about them? What's happening just now? Uh, it hasn't been very smooth in Tunisian football lately. With the political unrest, the economical unrest in the country, there has been some feud between the Ministry of Sports and the Tunisian Football Federation. Mm -hmm. This recently, like a few days ago, like a few weeks ago or something, FIFA has sent a letter to the Tunisian Football Federation demanding an explanation about what they deem to be potential or allegations of interference. Mm -hmm. And we all know, like, everyone in the football scene, like, whenever you say interference, your teeth sort of clinch, you know what I mean? Like, you think of, like, suspension and all that. So, yeah, I mean, uh, because the Ministry of Sports has repeatedly, allegedly accused the Tunisian Football Federation of corruption and and has threatened. And these actions and these allegations, the Ministry of Sports alleges that he has a legal power to dissolve the Federal Bureau, which is, like, the, the Bureau in charge of the federal, the Football Federation. Uh mm -hmm. Not sit well with the football federation. They consider this to be sort of like a threat and a potential interference, and this is not sit well with FIFA as well. So, yeah, okay. there's a bit there's that going on right now in Tunisian football. So, uh, perfect. Okay, uh, and then finally, uh, obviously, as I said, this game is in in Doha. Uh, it could be behind closed doors, you know, with no fans. It could be just playing like a training ground not in a stadium, uh, on November 16th. Um, how do you see this game going? What are your uh, predictions for this game? Uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting game. You know, honestly, I'm not very up-to-date on Iranian football or the Iranian national team. That's, but... what, that's, what, that's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. <laughs> yeah, That's uh, what we do. <laughs> I, I mean, it is. I don't think it's going to be easy. I think it's going to be a very, very interesting game, it's, especially the timing, just like like a couple of days before the World Cup, four, just four days before the Tunisia's first match right. against Denmark. It's going to be a very... I, I don't think it will be very, very intense because, as always, both teams are going to have to worry about injuries and all that. Nobody wants to lose a player just four days before the before the for the biggest football event in the world. Sure, sure. Especially if the game is going to be after the squad deadline. I think the deadline is November 14th. Yeah. So the squads. Yeah, two days after. On... Yeah, like straight after that. So no take backs, no changing any players and all that. No, so they, I think... they might they might allow some, like if anyone gets injured, they might allow some like temporary lists, you know, just in case any any injuries happen. But yeah, you're right. It's uh, It is a last minute uh, decision. Yeah. Hopefully no one gets injured. Yeah, exactly. So nobody wants to be in that position where they lose like a, a key player and all that. So I think Tunisia will be a bit cautious on that end. We might not see some key players. I This is just a speculation. I don't think we will see key players such as like Msakni or Khazri playing for long. They might, right. not be play, might not play for the full duration of the game. As always, I have fear for injury. Msakni just like escaped. Uh, an injury recently there was a lot of following it like people suspected that it's going to be a torn crucial ligament sure. but luckily it wasn't so I think Tunisian coach will play it safe and he might not push it to the to the end but still I think it will be a very interesting and exciting game to just to get a feel for it it would it would have been wonderful if there are fans present because yeah. Tunisian Tunisians in Qatar are huge, are a lot of numbers in Tunisia live in Qatar. And I think it will be a wonderful show and a wonderful spectacle. So, yeah. Okay. I appreciate the time, uh, Sohail. I really, really do. Hopefully, uh, best luck again. Best of luck to you guys uh, in Qatar. And thanks again for coming on our podcast.
Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's uh, such a pleasure. How can the, the people find you on social media? I am on Twitter. You can find me at Twitter at S Mira. And Perfect. I'll be there. Follow me for close updates on Tunisia. Excellent. Thanks a lot. All the best. Thank you. Take care. Cheers. All right. Thank you, for Sahil, for that. Uh, what do you guys think of the game? This is a friendly that's incredibly close to the kickoff with England. Not many teams are doing a friendly this close to the tournament, um, especially with Group B. So, yeah, what do you guys think? I think it's going to be a big um, opportunity for K. Roche because he still has only had these players for two games. So I I would expect that he's going to play the starting lineup for a half. I think that that's, you know, just to make sure everyone's on the same page and whoever his starters are, to just get them on the field one time together uh, before they play. And I don't think the Tunisians, they're in the same boat as us. You know, they're playing in a World Cup as well in a week so or in a few days. So I don't think they're going to be going at a super intense level either. But just to get everyone everyone on the pitch together, you know, make sure on a, just a positioning uh, sense and, um, you know, in terms of knowing their defensive duties and stuff like that, and to look at the overall shape, I think it'll be useful. And then I think it'll be a chance for other players uh, that aren't in that first unit to maybe show that, you know, I'm at the level where I can contribute off the bench or in the upcoming games after the England game. Son, pretty much covered it there. It's uh, it's good that we got two friendly matches be- uh, before the England game because, you know, we were lacking games in June. We needed friendlies. We only got one game against Algeria. Didn't go as planned. Got good two two good friendlies against Uruguay and, uh, and Senegal. We got one for the domestic players against Nicaragua. And now we get one for the full team against uh, Tunisia, who are a World Cup team. So it's good, you know, uh, that we got this. You know, kudos to the Federation for b- being able to prepare these and hopefully it's um these four matches are enough for Kairos to have implemented his plan for the for the first game against uh, England yeah no absolutely I think Kairos already knows who he's starting what the game plan is probably even knows what his substitutes are um so I'm, I'm not expecting this friendly to to play any sort of uh, importance in that sense I think it'd be interesting to see if Osman plays a part um, in terms of where he's up to as far as fitness is concerned. Uh, but Kairos also has the um, has history in terms of the preparation for the World Cup in these friendlies where he plays a random team. Um, we've seen Shojoyu, for example, start was against Turkey as, as the number six and Ansari Fah playing central midfield. He did the same in 20, um, in, the, in ahead of the 2014 World Cup as well. So I'm not expecting to learn a lot from the lineup. But as Sahan said, I think a half or half an hour he will play the sort in 11 against England. Well, um, since it's behind just... closed doors, he doesn't have to announce who played either. I don't think, I think the match report is going to go as far as telling the score and the goals. I think they, looking at the previous ones, we got to see who came on. Because I remember seeing, um, especially in, in 2014, I think it was against Trinidad and, Trinidad and Tobago. I might be wrong. In 2018, they, it was against Lithuania, and he also announced it as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think that there's got to be some kind of match regulation in which she's got to announce the uh, the starting eleven and and potentially the substitutes too. But obviously, we won't get to see any of the match. It's a good. It's a good friendly. I mean, Tunisia again. It's a World Cup opponent. Um, Absolutely. Who are going to be preparing for the World Cup? So it's also good for them. So it's going to be a good game for us to just get. You know the final touches of our preparation. I think um, uh, it's going to be competitive. I think it will be a game where uh, just hoping there's no injuries. That's just my only worry. Is just you know touch wood. There's no injuries. We can go into this game in England with with Tari and me being being fit, man. Come on. <laughs> I know, Sino. I know you're about to wrap up. I've got a question for all of you. Do you expect any surprises as far as the goalkeeper is concerned? I, I think Hosseini is putting a real. Um, difficulty in 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 uh Kiroche's uh, head just now I think because he's done really well for SLL he played really well really well against Senegal I thought he was brilliant we probably should have considered a few goals against Senegal actually he's somebody who all of a sudden has got that kind of um Ali Zahari effect where he's come out of nowhere he's performing to the highest level and he's causing Abed Zadeh and Bayron Van some some issues uh, so I think he could be could be surprising you never know but i think Bayron van is always going to be the the favorite to start 
I think the fact that, you know, if you had asked that question and Bayron Van was still sitting on a bench somewhere, then I would say that Hosseini has a real ch chance to take it. But I think since Bayron Van has been playing regularly and he has in, you know, the games he also played for us, he looked, you know, more assured. Um, but I don't, did he even play against Uruguay or Senegal? Mm. Did he play? Bayron Van. Bayron Van. Yeah, he started against Uruguay and then right. he got injured and then Abadzada came on for the like, yeah. last portion of the game. I, I think in general, though, like his form, even though Hosseini's form is very good, Bayron Van's form hasn't been bad enough that you would say, okay, he's like a walking mistake right now. So I think, and also Bayron Van from a leadership perspective and, you know, a vocal presence on the pitch is quite important to this team. So I think he will keep his spot, but yeah. Yeah, my point is like I guess combination of Vario and Sahan. I think the lead leadership qualities that he has and the distribution that he has isn't matched by the other two goalkeepers. However, I really like both um Abed Zadeh as well as uh Hosseini. So it's it's good problem that we've got, whether like the replacements are very, very, very good, that you can trust upon them in the middle of a game, like if um you know Baron Van got injured like he did in the in the Uruguay game. So, yeah, I think overall it's very good. We're in a good position with the goalkeeping situation. And I would just say that Bayron Van, you know, he might have failed in Europe, but I think he's a much better goalkeeper as a result. You know, from what I've seen of him for Paris Police and also for the national team, his play with his feet is not comparable to what it was before he left to Europe. He's actually comfortable with the ball at his feet to a good degree now. And his aerial uh, exits when he comes to claim crosses and stuff, I mean, it's not comparable to what he was doing against, like, Algeria, yeah. uh you know, Tun uh, Tunisia, where he was costing us goals because he was just doing bizarre things. Coming, I want to, I want to cast your minds back to just last point on the 2018 uh, preparation. The the last few friends we played against Algeria and Tunisia, similar to this one, we played in Algeria and we played against Tunisia. We lot we beat Algeria two one. The goal that uh, Algeria scored was a mistake. In Turkey Iran. also. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm just I'm just making these points okay. here, just for a bit of comparison. The, the goal that Algeria scored was a mistake by Bayron Van. And I was in that I was going crazy. I was like, this guy can't start, he's gonna make mistakes over and over again. And he had a great World Cup. Against Tunisia, we lost 1-0. And who scored the goal? It was Amir Mahamadi own goal. If you don't if you if you don't if you don't mind, if you don't remember. And Mir Mahamadi lost his spot. In the World Cup, and that was one of the defining factors. So, Kairos really has his favorites. You know, Bayron Van made mistakes, but he still played them. Milad Mahmoud made mistakes, but he played high Safi. So he has his favorites, and he'll pick who he feels is going to benefit the team. That was a big episode. We're going to wrap up the episode there. Um, thank you so much, all you guys, for joining. Uh, Arya, Sahan and Sina, thank you so much. And thanks for you guys for listening at home. We'll be doing another podcast before the England game. So we'll get you'll get our lineups and everything. And obviously, any coverage that we can do for the Tunisia game, anything that we hear, just follow us on Twitter. Uh, we'll, we'll cover everything that, that we hear. So yeah, thank you so much, guys, again. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you in the next episode. Hi, my name is Mansoud Shojai. You are listening to Gold Bazan Podcast.